um, is the one about the, um, the uh, Polish-Soviet War of 1919-1921. And the German armistice really left a, a political vacuum in that area because Germany had taken care, taken over that whole area. And they set about trying to create independent countries at Versailles. This was a major operation. And this is one area that I think has been not explored enough in this uh, whole issue of uh, the development of those countries. Each country had mixed uh, nationalities in them. And uh, under the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which has something like 12 to 15 different nationalities, many of them were mixed. And the uh, borders became almost porous, if you want to say that in that way. But there was an attempt to make sense out of this. Uh, with the idea of um, nations forming their own ethnic groups. It was divided both racially, no, not necessarily racially, but certainly religiously and linguistically in those areas. And there was a problem with the Poles who kept wanting to go back to their original um, definition of their country back in 1760, something or other, where their country was divided and stayed that way until 1918. Well, they wanted to create the greater Poland of their time. So their interest was both North, East and South. And so they led some uh, military um, movements in this area to guarantee them, particularly North towards Lithuania, which you see there is up above them. And then to the East, which is R Russia, and to the south is the Ukraine. And this was one of the things that the Poles were very much interested in. But Poland itself had, had three different armies um, during World War I. They were in the Austro-Hungarian army, they were in the German army, and they were in the Russian army. And so their weaponry expressed it. They had French levels, they had Mausers, they had different weapons, and all of them had different uh, caliber bullets. How do you create an army like this? Well, they did their best, but they wanted to create an independent Poland and a greater Poland. So they started moving in all these three directions. And um, fortunately for them, the Soviets were too involved in their own civil war to allow the Poles to move in there in these areas. Particularly, they got as far as, if you could see in the map, as far as Minsk that you see there right in the middle. Of, of the uh, map there. They got that far in Russia and they got almost to the whole of the Ukraine and they went north into Lithuania, each time being repelled or accepted. Then Kiev, you see way down here on the right, the bottom, they did take that part and they did get the support of the um, uh, Ukrainians because the Ukrainians didn't want the Soviets there. Now this is a mixed area of all kinds of people. I don't know whether you're geologically aware of this area, but a lot of it is flat and it's easy to move troops back and forth. One of the great battles that occurred here was between people on horseback, one of the last uh, cavalry charges in the war, uh, but they were also very well supplied. However, when the Poles asked for support from the British, they would not give them. Uh, Lloyd George refused to support the Poles because he favored the Bolshevik uh, labor parties, not necessarily the communist ideology, but the labor of them. And he saw Poland as an enemy of this. What the Russians wanted was to drive through Poland to get to Germany to create the Soviet um, philosophy dominant there as a westward movement. All of this is very confusing and led to a series of wars and battles. And at first the Poles were very successful. They moved all the way into that area like as, as far as Minsk, as far south as Kiev. They had more trouble up north in um, Lithuania, but eventually they had moved quite a bit, but they overextended themselves. Then when the civil war in Russia, the war with the, uh, was ended, it's Lenin, and you'll see a picture of the two people. Please bring up the Mar Marshal uh, Pilsudski up there. He's the great Polish general 
that led the greatest victories for them. And he was to come up when there is the famous Battle of Warsaw. All right, let's see Lenin. I want to pick Lenin's picture, there he is. It finally dawned on him after they had won in Russia, the real threat was Poland. So he moved over 1 million Russian soldiers to invade Poland and push the Poles out of the, what he called Belarusia. Well, the point is, is that this new Russian army was led by um, sometimes capable generals, but there was a lot of jealousy among the Russian generals. And who else was sent there but Leon Trotsky and Stalin. Stalin was in the southern part of Russia um, and invaded, he helped invade uh, Ukraine, took that over, tried to move into Poland from the south and Trotsky from the east tried to move there. He did get Lithuanian support. However, um, they were not very well prepared. They moved very fast. They were making something like 30 kilometers a day and pushing the Poles back. Uh, to them. They got within 60 miles of uh, Warsaw when finally they dawned on the Poles, they were to lose their independence. They would be crushed by the Russians. So Pilsudski moved as much soldiers as he could, both by rail, by horse, by whatever. And it's considered one of the famous battles of Polish history is the miracle at the Vistula on the river where they finally overwhelmed the Russians and push them further and further east, even causing them riots and routes. And uh, it was a thorough defeat for the Russian army. Finally, they finally agreed that they were exhausted. Both sides settled down and they formed the Treaty of Riga in 1921, where they finally formed the border between Poland and Russia. However, you must remember in 1939, this was not to ham handle very long. It was a very short time, it was less than 18 years. And Poland was had to sacrifice the Eastern part of their um, country. And Stalin took that over and never returned it. Since that time, that is still the border with Poland and Russia to this day. Okay, that's my first part dealing with the European, but this is one area that should be studied and I'd urge somebody to do some great research, if possible, on the independent countries. Remember, at the end of World War I, Yugoslavia became a country, Czechoslovakia became a country, um, Poland became a nation, um, all of them under the old Austro-Hungarian Empire. And it was a change in uh, both, uh, what do you call it, graphics, and uh, what do you call it? and geography as well as uh, what you would say, the nationality of peoples. Uh, World War I did not solve problems at Versailles. It created problems, problems that were to persist into World War II and beyond. All right, that's the first part I cover. The second one I wanna talk about is the Greco-Turkish War that happened then in 1920. 1919, 1922. And here's a picture of um, Mustafa Kemal, um, one of the great leaders of uh, modern Turkey and one of the most brilliant generals there was in their history. Now, the Greeks had been uh, forced, and I think maybe using the correct word, forced to join the allies in World War I, even though the King Constantine um, refused to do so. They forced him because he had a prime minister, Venezuelos, who was determined to join the allies because he wanted to create a greater Greece. <laughs> so Lloyd George promised the, Tur the Greeks they could have some land on the area called Anatolia, which is today modern Turkey. And what they did was something remarkable. They never gave specifics amount. Now it's hard to believe this, but there were close to a million and a half Greeks living in the Ottoman Empire and mostly in the city of Smyrna, which is now Izmir. Um, and it's quite remarkable how many of them were there among the Armenians, among the Jews, among the Syrians, they're all part of this Ottoman Empire. 
Now, remember, the Ottoman Empire is one of the longest lasting empires in history. It lasted 500 years. That's saying something. And it was on three continents. That's amazing how much that can be said about that. It had a very effective system of running its country. Uh, I urge everybody to read a book called Peace to End All Peace uh, by Fromkin. If you can remember that, it's a book dealing with what happened in the Middle East area after the Ottoman Empire fell. Okay, the um, Greeks moved in into that area and moved into Smyrna, first of all, with their armies. No, this is later, much later, but they are the ones who um, moved in with their armies and their victories were amazingly swift. Um, they moved quite a bit and quite effectively all over um, Turkey, which is modern Turkey. And, and they had, a, a, what do you call them, were very well equipped. They had um, good uh, leaders. They won the areas, but they were going, extending themselves beyond their ability to continue. And little by little, the Turks galvanized themselves to attack the um, Greeks and they were unbelievably nationalistic. Now, if you realize <laughs> the Ottoman Empire lost a million five hundred thousand people in their in World War One, they were down to their basic um, what do you call level of of what happened. It took a man like Ataturk to galvanize the Turkish people and particularly the men to drive them out. I might add this, but everybody wanted the Russians and the Greeks was to take Constantinople. At the end of World War I, it was occupied by both British, French, and Italian troops. Now, uh, there's another fact here. One of the reasons they got Italy into the uh, war on the side of the allies is they promised them things that they really had no intention of giving. Nobody wanted to see Italy become a great power, particularly the French and British but they had promised them land in the Anatolia area and one of them was Smyrna. Well, uh, the Greek army moved in there first, refused to give this land over to the Italian um, military. They had a, the Italians had their fleet there, but they couldn't go on land. And when they were not allowed or not given this area, they walked out on Versailles, if you remember that. And then they had to crawl them well as well back to finish their rule, but they never got Smyrna and they never got the lands that they wanted. They did get an association with the French and British control of the Bosporus. That is true. All right. So what happened here in this Greco-Turkish war? Well, uh, it reached a point where there was a battle and at this one battle where I'm going to try to get the name of it here, if I can pronounce it correctly, but there was a treaty called the Treaty of Sèvres, which was forced upon on the Turks uh, as the end of World War I, which Ataturk rejected and said, this is not the benefit of, um, to the Turks. And he opposed it and led an army against the Greeks who were trying to enforce that um, treaty. Uh, but the point is, they couldn't control all parts of Anatolia that they wanted. So the further north they, uh, the uh, Greeks went almost within sight of Constantinople, the Turks rallied themselves and gradually pushed the, the Greeks back further and further towards um, the, um, out of that area of Anatolia. And Ataturk gave the order to his troops go to the Mediterranean, stop there. And little by little, they reached the city of Smyrna where there were close to almost 800,000 Greeks and they set the place aflame. And, but you must understand under Turkish, uh, rather under Ottoman uh, city planning, there were Greek settlements, there were Jewish settlements, there were Turkish settlements. The Turks set fire to all the Greek settlements, but not the other two. And there was massacres. Now, there was a British historian that many of you heard about, Arnold Toynbee, he was there 
as a representative of the British government. And he saw that both the Greeks and the Turks were guilty of some of the greatest uh, atrocities of the war. There were no angels in this war, let me tell you. This is a vicious battle between the uh, Turks and the Greeks. Uh, and resentment was so deep that it's hard to believe this. Um, I'm of Italian background and I grew up with an expression uh, that was stayed with me, non di ferrare che son turchi, which translates roughly is don't trust them, they're Turks. And this is a feeling that was all over parts of Europe. Uh, finally, they pushing the Greeks out there, the um, Greeks were finally realized they could not continue. So they ended the war with the, the Treaty of Lausanne and they agreed on one thing, we have too many Greeks in the Anatolia and both sides agreed that they could exchange populations because they were um, Turks that were and um, Muslims under uh, Greek rule and some that were under Turkish rule. So they exchanged populations. 1,500,000 Greeks returned to Greece and over half a million Turks moved back to Turkey. And this was the, the, the uh, Treaty of Lausanne and there are the borders that you see of modern Turkey, which uh, Ataturk accepted. So these are today's um, borders and you see in, of that area. Now, uh, I might add this is that, um, remember that Turkey is still mixed with peoples. There are Armenians, there are Jewish people, there are Syrians, there are, um, what do you call it? people from all areas of that. So it's still a mixed country, but it barely, it has become modernized. He did quite a bit to modernize that country. So he is the symbol of modern Turkey. All right. Okay. I'm moving now from um, that area. Uh, oh, excuse me. I should go back to one thing. The battle that turned the whole in favor of the Turks is called the Battle of Dumlup Mar. And believe me, I don't have no idea where that is, but that defeated the Greeks and forced them to retreat out of the area of Anatolia. Okay, I moved to the United States now because something happened as well here. Uh, one of them is prohibition, which I'm gonna discuss, but there were other issues. There was a, um, a great European immigration now, from 1870 to 1910, in which close to three and a half million Europeans came to America, uh, immigrated. Suddenly there was a vast number that wanted to come here again in 1919 and 1920. But it just alarmed a lot of people here. In fact is most of the immigrants who came to America in that period, a lot of them moved into cities. And in cities, they became uh, very much, uh, what he would put it this way, their presence um, sometimes alarmed um, the Native Americans. They saw this threat to our, quote, Americanism. I'm not giving you words you don't know. This has come up a number of times, even today. Uh, so they wanted to, quote, maintain the racial purity of America. Now, I might add this, uh, that um, Jim Crow was already accepted America. Nobody even questioned it. It was just sort of an accepted thing at that time. And it was to last until 1964 when Johnson created his um, American, um, what do you call it, rights for uh, minorities in America. Uh, I might add this, that there was particular fear of Southern and Eastern Europeans in them. They, don't, they didn't mind Northern Europeans coming to America, but they wanted to limit the numbers from Eastern Europeans, particularly um, there were area, two areas that they were concerned about. And that was the Southern Europe and the Eastern part with many of those people with their strange customs, their different foods, their different languages, 
And the fact is that many of them moved into urban areas and it sparked something which most people don't see the relationship, but it was, is that they had uh, curious drinking habits. Uh, and this alarmed the, particularly the um, areas of what do you call, I would call uh, fundamentalist Protestant religions, particularly among the Methodists, among the Presbyterians, but not among the Lutherans or Catholics. Uh, they and the Episcopalians, they had no um, feelings at all about restricting the drinking, but there were a movement in that direction. And because of the influence of these religious groups, particularly, they wanted to end what they call saloon fever at the time. Uh, I'm always interested that it was the Women's Christian Temperance Union that was founded in 1873 that started the whole movement against uh, um, drinking. Particularly, they thought it ruined families, it uh, curb, curbed people's draw, uh, jobs, and furthermore led to drunkenness and open, uh, host, what do you call, uh, open crime in the United States. Well, the first state to outlaw um, the manufacture of alcohol was Kansas. And um, this was in um, uh, eight, 19, I think it was 1912 when they first did this. And eventually all the other states joined in. Actually the first state, you wouldn't believe this, but, but before that, right after the Civil War was the state of Maine. They are the ones who um, started the whole prohibition and six other states joined, but eventually they dropped it. But from now on, it was become a great movement in America. Now, the Congress did actually pass a bill uh, prohibiting the manufacture of liquor, and Wilson um, vetoed it. And that's always interesting, but the movement had been very strong in this country, and it went from state to state. And politicians who were running for office often were supported uh, financially by these uh, religious groups if they would vote for a prohibition. And finally, in 19... 19, 36 out of 48 states ratified prohibition. Um, I might add that this is quite an interesting thing. The 18th Amendment, as it is often called a Volstead Act, uh, finally passed both Congress and the nation. Two states deliberately, Maryland and Delaware, refused to join it, but they had to agree finally when it became an amendment in the country. Um, I might add that this was <laughs> something that proved to be um, almost impossible to con control. The government hired 1,500 agents. There you see them and that picture there, uh, ending in a big barrel of beer. Particularly did the Germans feel the effect of this because it's sort of an ordinary drink for among Germans. Now, it was prohibited to manufacture and produce hard liquor or wine or this and sell it. But it was not illegal to drink it. I might add that. And furthermore, you were allowed 200 gallons of wine, no beer. Beer was out. But you were allowed to make 200 gallons of beer, of uh, wine, in your family per year, as long as you didn't sell it. Well, this gave a boon to illegal uh, importation of liquors uh, from both Canada and from Mexico and from the Caribbean. They eagerly provided the cities with uh, the liquor because our borders are too porous. We had that problem with, uh, and we still have that problem with hard drugs, but in those days it was alcohol that was the big issue. And so <laughs> I always find this rather amusing that it no sooner than they enforced it, then it began to fall apart. Um, doctors particularly found it very convenient to write prescriptions for alcohol and pharmacists gladly joined in on this to the point where <laughs> it said that doctors made $40 million on the, during prohibition. And it lasted 13 years, I might add in um, the 21st Amendment in 1933, repealed it. 
it's the only amendment that has been repealed in our country's history. So that's amazing to see that that is true. Okay, um, I want to move on to one other area, which was a big scare also due to immigration, and that is the Palmer Raids. Let me see a picture of that. There is Mr. Palmer, who is a um, member of the Friends Committee. He's a, he's a um, what do you call it, a uh, Quaker. He didn't believe in moral violence, but he opposed all this um, new ideas that came from Europe. There were two of them. One was um, the Bolshevism, which he saw as invading the labor. And the other were um, the people um, called, and I'm trying to think of the right word for it. It's the, um, for heaven's sakes, you know, who am I drawing blank now? For it, it's, uh, oh, they were um, uh, not absolutionists. It's another term for it. I'll find it. And abolitionists, Sal? Abolitionists. I mean, abolitionists. Thank you. Thank you. Not abolitionists, they were anarchists. And most of them were Italians, and, and the others who are Bolsheviks, a lot of them were Jews. Uh, and his vehemence against them led to a raid on his house. They had put a bomb in his house. It didn't harm him, but it harmed one of his uh, employees, maids in the house. Uh, no one was killed, but nevertheless, um, there was a series of bombings by these um, anarchists most of them were ineffectual because they didn't know how to handle the bombs and they blew up rather than the victims they were after. And there was also a great deal of labor activities, many strikes in America at that time uh, after the war. There was a problem with men coming back from the war and this was a large, largely a reaction to the war. One of the things I think should be explored in great detail is the fact that Americans uh, right, no more than Versailles was started, then there was a reaction in America about us going into that war, that they blamed the, the munitions of death, which were the um, um, people who made weapons and explosives. They made money on World War I and they were the real cause of the problems. America gained nothing from World War I. We didn't get an inch of land. We didn't get anything from them. And so we thought that this was a reaction and it was inevitable there'd be a reaction to this war. Okay. Well, Palmer, who was seeing this thing, realized that you know this there was this element of, of potential. He had a raid in the country, particularly in the East Coast, of 3,000 people who were um, brought into jails and thrown into jail because he assumed that they were either anarchists or they were members of the Bolshevik party. And this was unbelievable. And it took uh, one or two men in the Justice Department to realize this was a vicious attack on American rights. And he finally, they moved them. So over 1,500 were released. Uh, over a thousand were retained, but then eventually they were released too. So it was down to 200. And this was a horrible uh, part, but he hired a young man from Washington, D.C., born and raised there, Edgar Hoover, as his uh, ally and his, um, more or less, his right hand man to push these uh, uh, raids in, throughout the country. And of course, he is the father of the Federal Bureau of Investigation and stayed in his office until his death. Now, this is the part that I found most in horrible at the time. There was another issue that occurred in that year, and I have this that I think is sad to say, is there were many race riots when, during that period of 1919, 1920. Um, most people don't realize that there were over 301 riot riots um, began in, in America. One of the worst ones was in Chicago of 1919, when a young boy, a black boy, swam in the Great Lakes from his point to where the whites were, and they drowned the kid. 
And this caused a great deal of riots in which 38 people were killed and um, were in the riots. Those were black and 15 in what were white. There were riots everywhere. The worst one in the South, and this is one of the things I couldn't, I didn't know anything about. It didn't occur in a big city, it occurred out in the country, in Elaine, um, what do you call Mississippi? And it's called the Elaine Massacre. And there's where social tensions came out and it's unbelievable how many were killed. 240 blacks were killed and five whites were known to have died at that um, rioting. Now, uh, I might add that there's this whole series of things that people don't know that of uh, between 1917, 36 blacks were um, lynched, two whites, 1918, 60 were blacks, four were whites. 1919, 76 blacks were, after, this is one of the worst years, and in, uh, in seven whites. In 1920, 59 blacks and eight whites perished. Now, the last lynching in America was in 1964, one black and two whites. All right, the total blacks lynched recorded from 1882 to the parent present was 3,445. This does not include many of the race riots occurring during the first 50 years of the country. And of the Hmong of whites that were killed and then lynched, 1,297. This is not the happy picture. I have one more picture I wanna show you that occurred not in the South, but in Omaha, Nebraska, Nebraska, a man named Will Brown was accused of robbing a place and he was taken out. And here is a brief photo. Please show that and make it brief. There it is. And this is in Omaha, Nebraska. All right, thank you on this, um, Melanie. Okay. Now, there are many issues that I did not cover that are far too deep for me to get into, but I would like someone to come forward and tell me if they have any knowledge about this area between uh, 1918 and 1921 in Eastern Europe, in Africa, in America, wherever, they, they would be willing to give a talk about this. Now, I'm open to questions. I grant you it's not very, long on my part, but I have a number of things I could still talk about. One of the things I want to ask you, tell you about, is that during the uh, riots between um, and the war between Greece and uh, Turkey, uh, again, the victims were often people who were totally innocent. Again, they were Armenians. Armenians, again, and one of the leading men in Turkey, uh, well, then the Ottoman Empire, Behadim Sakir was the one who gave the order during the war that although Armenians should be round up and removed and killed. And he escaped from um, Turkey at the end of the war because he knew they could be after him and he hid in Berlin. But he was followed and shot in the streets in Berlin. He was killed by an Armenian there. All right. Anybody have any questions? Sal, this is Ron Dries. Yes. Um, my father was born in 1911, and he said during Prohibition, more people yes. drank during Prohibition than before. Yeah, there is records of that. But it, oh, it was something like uh, 10,000 Americans died because they, quote, drank the wrong stuff. Uh, a lot of them were given materials that were not healthy. Uh, one of the reasons the government wanted to get rid of the prohibition is they had taxes on uh, beer and liquor, and it was good income for the country. And then and when they got rid of it in 1933, in the midst of the Depression, having uh, liquor made, by the, whether it be beer or hard liquor, gave jobs to people. And that was one of the main reasons to return to um, the drinking mood. Yeah, but you're right, Ron. There were a number of them who drank more during that time because it's always fun to break the law when you could, especially a law that doesn't make much sense. 
So I've got a couple of comments, honey. There's two, uh, Detroit's right across from Windsor, Canada, yes. and Prohibition was like open season. I mean, the number of boats coming back and forth was like a, a year round holiday. My mother grew up on a farm on Lake Ontario. And she said kids would come to school with wads of money in their pockets because their parents but had been out there offloading booze from ships that came and, lo and loaded on these boats. They'd bring it ashore where she lived is like kind of isolated. But uh, everybody who could make any money doing this was doing it. Well, let me tell you this. My father who was a fisherman in San Francisco with his fishing boat and his father were escorted by the harbor police beyond the three mile limit and loaded up, brought back the liquor. And my father loved prohibition. It was his pocket <laughs> money. He thought it was the greatest thing there is. And of course the harbor police got their share. I mean, this was a ridiculous law of every kind, but it was in a sense, you could say this, a reaction of old America to the change that is happening from immigration of those years. And the same thing is going on right now with the reaction of the mixed races in our country. And the idea that, you know, a the complexion of our country is gonna be different. It's different than it was when it was first started. And it was different from 1900 and the, from 2000. So this is another example of where people feel alarmed or threatened. Okay. Any more questions? We have another comment on the very first map you put on was where my mother's parents came from that had been part of Galicia as part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. In fact, the, there's a name on the map of Stanislaus, I think it is. You want to show uh, that map again, Melanie, please? Yeah, let me uh, show the map real quick. Uh, just give me a second here, PowerPoint. Sure. Start from the go back to the beginning here. Oh, there we go. Okay. There you go. The little the, down there, or the blue area where Lviv is, a little down below there is a place There's called Lviv. Stanislaw. There it is. I think. Yeah, right there. That's where my relative, my mother's, I think her mother came from that area because I have a, I have, they sent away for records in 1931. They got baptismal records. And for years, I used to wonder why did it say Polonia? Then I realized, well, it was Poland. And so anyway, but on the on the records, it shows that's, and then her, her uh, my mother's father was Vasily Federetsin, and he came from that area too. And on his application to become a citizen, he puts down member, citizen of Austria. They didn't call it Austria-Hungary, they called it Austria. Anyway, so he renounces his, to that to become a US citizen. But, but that was quite interesting, that location there, I thought on the map because that's where they came from. Um, yeah, thank you God, know, 1910 they came here. Yeah, that area I drove through in 1977 um, in, when I went through Eastern Europe at that time when it was um, that point. And um, it's interesting that we can still use German all over in that area because the older people were, when if they went to school at all, um, learned German. And it became the lingua franca of that whole region. Um, true that they have their own language, but they also were educated in German. And I was always impressed by what little German I could use. I was able to get around with no difficulty. Well, the German name for Galicia is Galitzen. And during World War II, there was an SS Galicia division. And when Putin called the Ukrainians fascist for that maiden, uh, uh, you know, in the, against the Russians, when he called them fascist, he wasn't exactly far off the mark from where my relatives came from, because th they fought with Austria-Hungary in World War One, and then in World War Two, even though they were uber mentioned, you know, they were inferior race. As the war went on, they did for, the Germans formed this SS coalition division, and to this day, they have burials there honoring these veterans. <laughs> so, yeah, it's. Yeah. Uh... For one thing, borders are not exactly clear and them. Nature doesn't give a damn about borders. And so um, they had to be drawn on a map almost ineffectively. This is the same thing that happened in the Middle East. Again, I urge everybody to read this book called A Peace to End All Peace by Fromkin. 
It's an explanation of what happened with the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire and the creation of nations in the Middle East. Again, they were not nations before. Um, you know, that's what happens in this, this area. All of them done by Europeans in 1918, 1919. Uh, and so I would urge anybody to get that. There are a number of books on this. You know, it's a hard thing to explain to people in this country why we are involved in the Middle East militarily as well as diplomatically. And you, you often come up with an empty space. What happens is, in effect, is it's all the result of World War I. And that's where I keep telling people, you've got to study World War I to yeah. understand what our current situation is today. Mm -hmm. This war still haunts us. It'll be with us for a long time. To come back to the United States for a minute, another yeah. thing worth mentioning about what is with us for a long time is that you said the United States didn't get anything from World War I. It didn't get property from World War no, I. No. But it became the the world's banker, the Mellon family, and yes, the rest did. of the banking system was essentially invented here and took over so that everybody in the world owed us loans afterwards. We also got dominance in steel. We surpassed the rest of the country in that. All well, we did that happened. earlier. We did that just earlier. Before the war. You're right, just before the yeah. war. And but um and uh and in exports. And yes. so, you know, it's a huge change in the world order. This is where we became the, the leader of the world. Well, the world, world War I really propelled us into world dominance in every way. You're right. Mm -hmm. That was one of the gifts we got from that war. But there was a great- Is that really a gift? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know if I, I don't know about that. I don't know. Well, let's just put it this way. It's a gift wrapped in a different kind of paper. <laughs> anyway, Sal, but that is the Sal, truth. Yes. Sal, I, I can tell a couple of family stories about 1919, 1920. My maternal grandfather was the chief electrician for the Alcoa aluminum plant in East St. Louis. Mm. And as such, mm. he was draft deferred. But many of the people who worked in the plant, in the rail yards, because East St. Louis is a uh, railroad nexus. Yes, it is. Trains going across the Mississippi. Yeah. And even in the port along the, uh, the uh, Mississippi waterfront, the white soldier, white people who had worked in those places were replaced, were drafted or volunteered and were replaced by African-Americans from the South. Yes. There was a huge migration of African Americans into East St. Louis, 1915, 1916. Well, the soldiers all came home and they wanted their jobs back. That's right. And this led to a huge amount of friction, particularly yes. in the city of East St. Louis, and ultimately led to a long series of race riots that went on, on and yeah. off for over a year. Yeah, you know, the interesting thing in all these lynchings that I've been reading about, there was very little prosecution against those that perpetuated, you know, who did them, who, who created them. And what bothers me more than anything else is that most people in America accepted it. And I, I find that almost incredible that they just said, let, allowed it to happen. And this is another sad. Someone has a question about the Sacker. A uh, Vanzetti case in World War after World War One, and the when you read the trial of that case, uh, most of it, it doesn't seem to make much sense. Um, when they put down the um, facts for the case, they found out that these two men had thick accents, and yet when they heard the action of what went on for arresting, they spoke perfect English. And they were different people, but they countered these two people. And it reached the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court defended the, um, what do you call it, the decision to have them executed. And they were. There was a lot of misunderstanding, a lot of, of I would say, misinformation. 
but a lot of prejudice that was deep-seated and hard to remove at that time, even now, even now. One thing you could have mentioned that you didn't, but it, it, the, the Ku Klux Klan probably reached its zenith after World War I. Well, it was more um, in the 20s uh, on that than in the well, right it's after still, the it, it, It's still un, un, unopposed. I mean, a lot of states- Yes, it was. All over the country had really, you know, well-organized, massive numbers of people in the Ku Klux Klan. Right. And there was a lot of nativism, you know, this- uh, Oh, you American can't get rid of that. And, no. No, you I can't. know. It's, it's, that's, a, that's a deep vein yeah. uh, in our history. Yeah, it's, uh, we don't have a clean history, but then no country does. Uh, but anyway, ours, at least we are open about it and we let yeah. everybody know we have these difficulties. Well, I have a, only one other thing to urge people to do is get into our website at the World War I HA, historical association.org. And there's a lot of information about World War I there. And we urge you to become a member if you're really interested in this area of history. And, you know, as someone said, history is a nightmare we can never awaken. Uh, it's true. It's, it's what this all the time. And the more we study it, the more we understand ourselves. And that's the whole key point. All right, anybody have any other questions? Sal, I'd like to recommend uh, Paris 1919. Oh, yes. yes. Yeah, that's great. That. Look at the maps at the beginning of the book. And it's right. such a surprise to see Poland pop out of nowhere. Yeah, yeah. Poland is a big country. You know, it's the third largest country in Europe. And uh, it has a, a lot going for it. And I don't know how many Americans can claim Polish descent, but there are quite a few. Um, and it's amazing that, uh, you know, a lot of them came to America. And they came under three different nationalities before World War I. They come into Austria-Hungarian, under German, and under Russian. And it's amazing how many of them have come to their country from those three areas. Can you imagine unifying a country with, that had been divided like that three times um, in three areas? Um, and, you know, they must have faced each other at the battlefield at some point when they were in the Russian army facing the German or the Austria-Hungarian. I, I don't know how. <laughs> how they relate to each other afterwards. Um, it's just one of those things that happen. Anyway, well, that's where we have I am. We a huge Polish population in Detroit. In fact, there's a city called Hamtramck at one time was like ground zero for the uh, Polish community. And now it's all full of Muslims from Bangladesh and these other countries. It's, it's, it's the, the most recent influx of, you will, if you will, of immigrants and uh, what happens is the Polish third or fourth generation moves out to the suburbs and so on and intermarries and, you know, uh, the next group comes in. So part of the American it's, experience. It's, it is. Um, anyway, these, I mean, America is a nationality mix, period. I mean, you can claim all your heritage from one to another. Um, I you know, feel that this is one of the strengths of America is that we are have an ex, we are an experiment of um, what do you call it your marriage, and I think it's a great thing that we have this. It proves that we're really citizens of the world, in more ways than one. Now, again, I appeal to everybody who's been with us today. If you have an area you'd like to talk about in World War One or anything related to it, please put my email there, and. Give me your information and we'll put you up. I need somebody for February the 13th. Okay, please give me a name. <laughs> Let me put uh, Sal's email here. Okay. Well, I appreciate you giving the presentation. My uh, great grand, my grandfather was a machine gunner for the Austro-Hungarian army in World War I was captured and put in an Italian POW camp for three years. Then when the Czech Legion was formed, he became a Czech Legionnaire and fought against uh, the Austro-Hungarians in, in the, the Forgotten Front, it's called the White War in the South, in Italy. Yes. Yes. He ended up, I thought he was done when the war ended, but he ended up fighting against the Red Mugyars 
in Slovakia when the Hungarians were trying to take over Slovakia was finally released from service in 1919. And I found a lot of his records through a person, his name is uh, Jan Triska, wrote a war of the Great War's Forgotten Front. And uh, we, we finally realized talking that his father and my grandfather probably were in the same POW camp, probably shared cups of coffee and, and cigarettes at the same time because they were both heavy machine gunners in World War I. And would my father came to, over in 1920. John, would you would you be willing to give a talk on that? Well, I'd like to. I'd be happy to go ahead and pull some more information together. Sure. Well, get my email and send me all the information you can. Okay. And I just finished a, a book, The Great Fire, by Lou Erenek about the Smyrna, the first twentieth uh, yeah. century's first genocide. I just finished it last month. Yeah. It's um, a sad, sad story. It's unbelievable the cruelty that went on in that Greco-Turkish war. Uh, between the two of them. One scene in there where they actually slit the throats of children. I was reading this, it just, un it just got to me when I read these things. Uh, you know, I don't know what war does. It brings out the worst and the best of everyone, of anyone. And uh, this is certainly one example of that where it was just impossible to comprehend. Uh, oh, Sal, my uh, name's... Go ahead. Uh, I'm this is Tom Lawrence, and I haven't participated for a while, and I just joined in today. And I really want to thank you and Melanie. This is really an outstanding program, and I just wanted to share too. Uh, I live here in the East Bay in Castor Valley. Uh, I've had the privilege of serving under three presidents in appointed capacities, and I've always looked at things in a broad perspective. And it's it's so hard for people to understand. And you've done an excellent job today. You know, for 99% of human history, there were no such thing as nations and how they are new creations in human history and how hard it is and difficult it is to create and maintain and improve a nation. And that's something that, uh, you know, is, you know, we're looking at today, but it's just a lot of people don't understand that nations are new and artificial. They weren't part of nature. No. <laughs> They're human creation. And the tragedy of World War One, and I always, actually, what I, when I've discussed this, I've always referred to it actually as European War Number One, because to me it was all about Europe with ramifications because of the colonies, etc. But it's really about that from my perspective. And you're 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 adding in on the prohibition and everything that happened during that period of time too. I lived in Las Vegas for many years, and I got to know Mo Delitz, who was one of the eight founders of organized crime and was the main bootlegger uh, with the Purple Gang and the Mayfield Gang out of Cleveland. And uh, I, I knew him in a proper manner, a business manner, but I listened to a lot of the stories about how that all happened in Detroit and going over to Windsor and, uh, and the whole development of that, which is, I'm glad you brought that in because that is part of the ramifications of this. Oh yeah, well, you know, most people don't know that it was only in 1910 that um, passports were first created. I mean, you had, there were passports before, but then it became a requirement that every new nation had to have passports if any of their people were to leave their nation and go anywhere. And so it became a fact of life. Uh, but before then, often just a piece of paper saying that you lived in this city under these people and that was it, it's all you needed. And there were hardly any border restrictions in those times. But we've changed. In this same vein, I'm so glad you're talking about these things that are new inventions and the and, oh, yeah. and it's worth a huge discussion about just the impact of Wilson, who didn't really know what he was saying, using the phrase self-determination and building it in in 1919. Yeah, it was. How the hell do you define that and all of the all of the damage and death? that caused. Yeah, yeah, it was a very awkward time in 1919, 1920, uh, that period of history. Yeah, you know, it seems to me that when we look at it honestly and straightforwardly, we do learn some things from it. We do. You know, it does change you and it broadens you. Uh, as Mark Twain said, that travel is the enemy of prejudice and uh, what do you call it and all kinds of uh, misjudgments. And I think he's right. It's always worth it to travel. I love it. I love traveling. And so I do it. Although this year and last year, there's been no travel, as you know. 
And so I want everybody to stay safe and be healthy. And um, so we can go back and get travel. vaccinated. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. vaccination. Are I'm 84 years old and I'm waiting in line, but I don't know whether I'll get it right away. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'll see it before the end of February. But are anyway, you, I want to thank California everybody. Now? Are you in are, California? Yes, I am. Yes. Uh, yeah. Greetings from the East Coast. You guys are having a tough time out there. Yeah, we are. We are indeed. Yeah. Well, listen, everybody, thank you very much for attending. Yeah, uh, good, thank good presentation. Thank you. thank you very much. Bye bye. Right. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Sal. Thank, thank you, everyone. And uh, our next meeting is, uh, I believe, the 13th of February. Sal, is that correct? That's right. That's correct. Okay. So, and again, let me, uh, if you have Sal's email in the chat, if you want to, if you would like to present. Uh, please contact him or contact me at the association. I'll pass it on. So we'll see you February 13th. All right, Melody, thank you for being with us. You've been an angel for me. Thank Take you. Care. Bye, thank everybody. You, thank you, Melanie. Bye-bye. Thank you, Bye. Melanie. You're welcome. Bye. Thank you.